Okay, today's January 20th, 2017, and we're at uh, the home of June Belich, and uh, I've twisted his arm, and he's uh, agreed to tell me a, a uh, one of his stories that he hasn't let a lot of people know, and so with that said, June, take it away. Hi, I'm uh, June, and uh, when I was uh, a young man, there was a man named William Woolsey that was a full-time sheep herder, even right up to the time that uh, I had met him, he still was involved in sheep herder a little, a little bit. Well, I had been in the Uinta Mountains for quite a number of years, and I had a partner that walked up with me, and I'm sure there's a great number of people have heard his name. His name was Cecil Dalton. Well, Cecil uh, had heard through his family that one of his uncles or there with somebody directly involved in his family had uh, found a mine in the Uinnets. This was according to Woolsey's family. So we attempted then to find Bill, find out where he was living, and go visit him to see if he would tell us the story. Well, we started looking for him, of course, in various places he had lived. One of them was in Salt Lake City. Another one was in the Provo area. Another one was in Ogden. So he moved around quite a bit. We first checked out the Salt Lake area, could find no information. We then went to Provo and we couldn't find any information. And then somewhere along the line, and I don't know who it was, told us that Woolsey used to work for a sheep herder that ran out of Provo and he had an egg farm. So we, of course, then made another trip down, spent the day down there, found out that he was on the south end of the uh, mountain, about, today it would be about 105 south down in there in the Draper area. And this is where this egg farm was. Well, we found out where that was and so we went to the egg farm and talked to the owner. And he says, oh yeah, I know Bill real well. He says, uh, he's done a lot of jobs for us. And I said, well, is he out there on a job now or nothing? He says, nah, he's getting too old. He really isn't doing much sheep herding. He said, but I, I can tell you where he lives. Oh man, that would be great, we told him. He says, he lives right there in Ogden just a little bit ways north of you guys, where you live. So he gave us the address. He, uh, he did have Bill's address. So we went up to Ogden, and he lived right across some, some railroad tracks that was going into Ogden. I think it was a spur of some kind. Anyway, there were some old railroad houses there. And this was a little square one that was white. And uh, it's very small, but I assume that's who he rented that from, was from uh, the railroad. Well, we uh, knocked on the door, and Bill Woolsey showed up. I told him what we was there for. He says, oh, yeah, he says, I, I'd love to tell you that story. And so we come in, and we sat down. And he started telling us the story. First thing he said that he was doing some sheep herding for a gentleman that had some, uh, oh, I don't know what they call them, you'd say like a claim in mining, but this was uh, an area that they gave sheep herders where they could run their sheep over the mountains and stuff. He said he'd been sent there from another job that he had when he was out on the West Desert. 
So we went into uh, the UN area with the man he was working for, and they took him up to a place where he said that what you would recognize the most would be a place called Low Pass. So he said he uh, set up his camp and they brought him food for probably a month's supply of dried meats and different things, eggs. He says then, he said that uh, as he was herding the sheep, he kept moving them from the west side of the mountain to the east side, just moving them along the hills. Well, of course, he then had to uh, leave his camp in different directions to keep him headed north to where he was going. He said, one time he said, I left camp and I got on a well-defined trail and I was walking part of the way and then I would ride part of the way. He said, we come up to a edge of a mountain where it had a point sticking out on the hill. And he said, as we rode by on the horse, he said, there was a hole that was up on the side hill. And he said, I got off the horse and walked up and I could see timbers sticking up and one coming across this way. And the dirt had fell away on this upper portion for about two feet and opened this hole up. And he said, I recognized them to be mine timbers. I had seen a lot of them. And he said, I was going to dig this hole out. But he said, instead, I got a hammer. He said, because there was a, a, a corner and the mine timbers was kind of held up with the rock behind it because it was solid. So he says, I could see metal in that rock. So he said, I took a hammer and I broke out pieces of the rock and put them in a sack and brought them down. Now I didn't recover it up. I didn't do anything with it. I found it. I left it just as I had found it. Now I don't know how many trips I made it up that trail, but he said it was a lot of trips. But I can tell you this, that if you got on that trail and walked and walked it all the way out to a point, all you had to do is to look down and you could see the river. He says, so I was pretty close to looking down at the bottom of the canyon. He said, when I, he said, I recommend that, I uh, re remember that very distinctly, he said, because of the amount of times I had traveled that trail and seen that mountain. Uh, as I done that, because I had broke the rock away, I made a good recollection of that so I could tell it to a dentist in Salt Lake City that was uh, funding me on some trips. And he had agreed that if I find anything that I would have to, uh, he'd have to take it, find out what it was worth, and then he would give me half. So that was a good, a good deal for me. I was there anyway and saved him a lot of hunting in the mountains. I do recall that Behind us, where I had my camp, and a little to the west, was a the top of the mountain, and it had a low arc in it. And that was called Low Pass because of that low arc in the mountain. But he had told me, not me in June this time, when he was revealing the story, he says, in order to get to the mine, you have to go through Low Pass. And then, 
get up on that ridge and ride that ridge out to see Provo, the, or the West Fork of the Duchesne. He said, I, like I said, I rode that many times, and that river was a distinct part of knowing where this mine was. He said, so I uh, brought the rock back after the end of spending a year there. He said, I brought the rock back and took it over to the dentist's place. And the, there was no dentist there. He was out. He said, so I just left it with a lady that had an office right down the hall from where hit where this uh, sheep herder's office was. Dentist's office? Huh? Where the dentist office was? Yeah. Uh, anyway, I remember that uh, I had went back then on several occasions to talk to the dentist and he, he wasn't there. The last time I went, I noticed there was papers was on the door. And I went to the lady I'd left that rock with, and she said, yeah, he's uh, closed that office up, and he's no longer there. And I said, do you know where he is? And he, she said, yeah, he's in the insane asylum in Provo. I said, are you sure? She's absolutely sure. He says, you remember the rocks that you give me? And I said, yeah. He said, well, I took them to an assayer. And the assayer was just right on me, constantly trying to get me to tell them where this place was that I found this mine. And uh, she gave me the name of the assayer. I went down and talked to him. I think it was Crimson and Nichols, if I'm not wrong. He was a well-known assayer in Salt Lake. So when I got down and talked to uh, Nichols, is the guy I talked to, he said, oh yeah, we remember Bill. He says, we called him and visited him several times. We couldn't, uh, we couldn't find him. And uh, I said, well, do you know where he is now? And they said, yeah, he's in the same asylums. Uh, that, uh, I said, why is he there, do you know? He said, well, when you brought the rock, he said, we assayed it, and it was $57,600 to the ton, and some odd pennies. He in, said, in gold or silver? Or in in gold, gold, in gold, pure gold. No silver was with it that I know of. I just know what the uh, Crimson and Nichols he had told me when I went down to talk to him. Uh, he said the uh, dentist then started looking for you, who are who your your bill, aren't you? And he says, yeah. He said, well, he started looking for you after we gave him the assay. He says it was so rich that he went all over that west face of the Uinas and up through there looking for you and looking for that mine. And he said, from the stories of the family, it drove him nuts. That's all he could think of, and that's all he would talk about was that mine that was there, and it was so rich. And even the rock that you brought and chipped out of the corner had to do with possibly the vein. I don't know. But yeah, they just went right through with the tunnel and probably followed the portion of the rock that I chipped out. And I said, so tell me that again about how you get find this mine. He said, well, you have to go through Low Pass. And when you go through Low Pass, he says, there are several trails in through there, but you gotta get on the trail that if you follow it, you'll go out on the point and you'll be able to look down and see the West Fork of the Duchesne. So with that information, that's all I had to go on, was to go up there and look for it. In the meantime, before Bill had died, it was getting on the winter of that 
same winter and I asked Bill if he could go up during deer season and show us where that mine is located. And he says, absolutely, I'll go up with you. So it was, I believe, around October 18th or 19th, somewhere in there. And what year is this? Oh, it's, it's in the very early 60s. Okay. I couldn't give you the exact year. Right. I, I wrote it down on a map that I had drawn while talking to Bill. But anyway, uh, he said that if you go out on the ridge and look down, you'll, be, you'll know that that's the hill that the gold is in. So that was our first thing that uh, me and Cecil went up and started looking for. But we could never find the trail of the many trails that he was talking about. Only that we was looking for one that went up over the ridge and uh, to the end. You could look down and see the river that Bill talked about. Another clue that he had given us, he says, just east of that area, he said there's some dipping vats. Now a dipping vat is a place where they dug a hole out and put a fence across the upper portion of it and they had to be near a spring, so they filled that with water from the spring, and then they put chemicals in it to kill bugs and lice and things like that that would get in the sheep's uh, wool. So he said they would herd the sheep into there and they'd go up and get up almost up to around their neck. And he says, and then they was herded out through a little opening at the top. But he, they got a good soaking of that uh, chemical through the dipping vats. And he said, not far from the dipping vats, he said there was a huge tree. And that tree was alongside of another trail that took them over to a, another sheep camp that belonged to another person that rained sheep further east. That's about all I can tell you, except I'll go up there and show you where that mine is uh, by deer season. Well, I didn't have much money. Cecil didn't have any money. He had a family that was him, hers, and theirs. So there was 10 children he had to feed. It was quite a, quite a family. Well, anyway, we uh, talked with Bill more about it and told you the date that we would be up. So we got our deer licenses, and, and uh, I had an old 1947 Ford flatbed with six-foot sides all the way around, and it was a well-built trailer, you might say, onto the end of that flatbed. And we covered it with a huge army tarp all the way around it, sealed it on the bottom so no air could get in, and then we had a big flap coming down on the back. And we filled that full of straw, maybe two feet deep. And there wasn't room for three people in the front seat of this 47 Ford flat by the head. And it was a one ton, but it was a short one ton. Anyway, uh, we decided I would let Cecil drive, and the little heater we had was probably about that big, maybe uh, 10 inches wide. It had two flaps on it that opened up to blow the heat out. And uh, we figured, well, we better let Bill sit right in front of that heater because of his age. So we done that, and there was, then I, myself, and there was a friend that I had, he was just a kid that lived over the next street over. He wanted to go up with us. And so me and him rode in the back of that Ford flatbed in the straw, and I had what they called a flying suit on that was full of fur all through it. 
pull a rabbit fur. And it was warm. But we rode all the way up. Just by the time we got to where we had to go, it started snowing terribly. And we had just maybe got into the Heber Valley with our vehicles. And we kept going. It had a good set of tires with big holes in the side about, oh, about the size of, uh, bigger than a dollar around that give you grip for them tires. Well, it, by the time we got halfway up, on that mountain, it had a full eight inches of snow on the road. We didn't know whether we'd make it or not. So we kept on going, and we went as far as we could go with that two-wheel drive pickup. If we had a four-wheel drive, we probably would have made it. But all we had was the Ford flatbed. We got up maybe three-quarters of the way, and we just kept spinning out and spinning out, and we couldn't make it up. So we made camp there that night, pulled off the road, made camp, and the next morning we woke up and there was an additional two inches where we camped. So there was a good, between 10 and 12 inches, I would say, of snow. Uh, we hunted all day long, being as we'd made the trip, but there was so much snow there that it was almost impossible to hunt. So before it got dark that evening, we decided to come home. We folded our camp gear up, put it in the back of the truck, and brought it down. And after all, oh, I guess it was maybe 4 o'clock in the morning by the time we got down in the valley and on our way to home. Bill still lived in Ogden. And uh, we took him home first. And he didn't make an indication at all that he got very ill or sick on that trip. So we didn't check on him for clear into the next spring after the snow had left. And he had agreed to take us up when the snow left. So... About that time in the spring when the snow had really melted on the side hills and, and possibly was gone, although that was right up at the peak, I'm not sure the snow would have been gone, and the west fork of the Duchesne was on the north side of that peak. And that's, of course, where the snow stays the longest. Well, we uh, brought our camp gear home, like I said, and waited till the spring. I drove up to Bill's house that spring, and I would say it was possibly April by the time I got to him. Nice and warm. We was going to go up and have him take us up and check it out. When I got there, there was nobody in his house. So there was houses nearby, and went over and knocked on a few doors, and finally there was a woman that knew Bill and knew about him. So she gave us some bad news. When we went over to talk to Bill, he had died during the winter. I don't know what he had died of, but she thought it was something sudden, like a heart attack. But whether or not it was that, or whether he got pneumonia or something, I'm not sure of. But Bill had died, and we had no way of knowing how or when, only that it was sometime during the winter. And uh, didn't even know his, if his relatives knew. Uh, that's pretty well the story, except, like I said, Bill had drawn us a map. And he had the dipping bats on the map. He showed a low pass. And there was that big tree as a marker. And he said, don't go beyond that tree. That tree has carvings in it of some other sheep herders. He said, it's a huge tree, probably, oh, two and a half feet 
in thickness. Was it a pine tree? It or was a, a pine tree. And the, the leaves were, or the branches where the carvings were, were all cut off. And it was up maybe six feet off the ground. And then the tree was growing, of course, from there up. Well, I was interested, of course, in the markings that might be on the tree. And when I went up, I found out it was the trees that the sheep herder had marked and probably the boundary because there was one with a set of initials on the east side and there was some with a set of initials on the west side. And I'm sure that's the initials of the person that had the uh, contract with the Fed Forest Service to run sheep there. Uh, so if you go up looking for the mine, you want, I want to tell you that it has never been found to my knowledge. The mine may have caved a little more on the top and covered it up again for all I know. Uh, but you want to go up that trail when you're on that same hill you want to come down off of the trail and go alongside the mountain where you can look up on there and you'll see where the hole is, if it's still open, you'll see a hole that's probably about two feet. Mine timbers on the side, mine timbers on the top, and just an opening there with rock showing around the timbers. Showing around the timbers is where he chipped the rock and that assayed, like I say, at $57,600 and some odd cents. And that assay was done by Crimson and Nichols in Salt Lake. It was my assay, so I know it was the truth. Uh, I, I would show Terry the assay if I still had it. But I had loaned that to Cecil Dalton and ask him if he would. Now I'm talking about uh, the assay that Bill had that Crimson Nichols would give me because uh, Bill was dead. And that was in the very early 60s. That was an authentic uh, assay. Today, you want to take $30 thirty thirty five dollars a ton versus what is this thirteen hundred dollars today yeah twelve hundred okay take that figure of fifty seven thousand dollars and convert it to today's prices and you'll see that it's so astounding that it's incredible it's, uh, it's actually worth probably right close to in the neighborhood of one million dollars per ton of that piece that he gave with the gold running through it. Did, did you see the, the the rock that he had or not? I did. Then could you see the gold in it? Or? Yeah, you could still see. Crimson didn't crush the whole thing. He just had a little piece left and it was kind of a brown rock. Uh, and he showed me strings of, of wire gold it looked like in that rock along with splotches of chunks of gold maybe not quite as big around as a dime but little spot splotches in that rock and it was I'd say all oh, two two inches by maybe one inch the piece that he saved and I said, well, I'd, I'd like to have that rock if I could have it. And he gave it to me. And I had that for a long time. I showed it to a lot of people. And one day I went in to get it. And it was gone. Somebody had typed it. I don't know who. Doesn't really matter at this day and time, you know. I seen the gold. I seen the rock. It was in, a, like I say, a brown. The rock, of course, can change in venuous materials. It can change from 
browns to like pearly white if you get into the vein where it's not so super rich. A lot of the coloring in a rock that's shaded with brown and blacks is iron that has been shot up through the vein and deposited in that rock. And so it's, it's merely a stain that is on that rock, I think, of the one Bill gave for an assay. Don't know for sure unless I'd found the vein for sure, but I know it's there. Bill was an old man. No reason for him to lie. No reason for him to go up on the mountain with us and ride in that old 1947 Ford flatbed. Uh, he was just very genuine in him wanting us to find that mine. He said he had told a lot of people that story in his family, but none of them believed him, he said. He said, I finally found somebody that believes me. And he says, uh, I'd like to find it just to show my family the disrespect that they had gave me because they didn't believe I found it. They so, just, so he tried looking for it himself again? No, Bill never did find, look for it. Okay. Nor did he take his family up. They didn't believe he found it. They just gave him a hard time about it. Did you spend any time looking for it? Oh, yes. Me and Cecil went up, uh, I guess, two or three times, maybe four. Uh, we just didn't have any uh, luck in finding that particular trail so that we could get on the side and walk up and find it. Yeah. Uh, but there are mountains there, if you look at them on a topog map, you can see a couple of the hills that you can ride out on, and they even got them marked as a path, that you can ride out on and look down and see the river. So I know Bill was telling us the truth, but we looked and never could find it. Uh, Cecil had stole, uh, told that story to several people uh, without my knowledge. Uh, so, so I was just going to say that I know that one of the, the writers, I think maybe George Thompson or something, put this story in his book, and I don't think that the, 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 the old, older prospectors, treasure hunters, probably know who you are, but these newer guys don't. But but, uh, you know, a lot of these, most, a lot of these stories that are in these books came directly from you. And, and so, so I'm, I'm suspecting that that's how George Thompson got that story. Is it in John, George Thompson's book? Yes. The Wolsey Mine? Yes, George put it in. And I went to George, uh, supposedly was a good friend of mine. And he wrote the story and put it in a book again without my knowledge. But the story had been presented to him was wrong. Cecil, many people had took that story and looked for that mine and was very, very, I'll use the word pissed off because they couldn't find the things that Cecil told them. Uh, I went up one time with, I'm trying to think of who it was. Might have been Steve Schaefer, but it may not have been. But I went up one time, and here come two guys up on horseback up out of the, uh, up off of the West Fork of the Duchesne. And uh, I introduced myself, and we talked, and he said, you're the guy that George wrote about in some other articles, June Belich? And I said, yeah, that's me. He said, do you know where George Thompson is? And I said, well, yeah, I believe he lives in Layton somewhere in a log cabin with his mother. He said, well, if you ever tell the SOB, tell him when I see him, I'm going to kill him. Wow. <laughs> and I said, 
<laughs> You're going to what? He said, yeah. He says, I have been up here all summer long with a partner of mine, and we're from Washington all the way down from the West Coast on Washington. And we read that story that thought it was true and there was that we could trust it. So we come down and we've spent all of our summer, quit our jobs, just had enough money to buy groceries off and on. And he said, now we find out that it's not right, that he wrote the story wrong. So I went to George and I said, George, why did you write that story? I said, do you know that Cecil, I think they put in there that they took one of his old cars up. Well, I said, as far as I know, he didn't have an old car that he could take up there, but I said, it wasn't him, it was me. And it was my 1947 Ford. So I asked George, why did you put that in there? You knew it was false. He says, well, it sells books, doesn't it? <laughs> and I said, yeah, just from now on, watch your behind if you go in the mountains, because these guys are looking for you. <laughs> and that's the truth. Give a little truth to the story, like I told you. I'll, I can just tell you what Bill told me. You have to go through low pass. And he mentioned the dipping bats. And he mentioned that big tree that don't go beyond that tree or you've gone too far. And that was up on the ridge, headed east, and it was just slightly down off the ridge line on the south side. And that's really all I can tell you about the area and where he sent us to hunt. But we didn't have any luck finding that trail. I know if we could have found the proper trail and rode out on it, that we'd have found that mine if we'd have had enough time and if it hadn't caved in. Nowadays, there's new electronics. There's new things found that have been found with these new electronics. I have some myself. Terry knows about them. But uh, I have never gone up with my stuff, new electronics yet on that. Just too busy and getting too old to uh, look for everything now. You've, you've got, uh, when it comes to this stuff, you, are, you have far more knowledge about this stuff than anybody I've ever met. And you've shared, I know that, yo, know, and me, you, and, and Sean rode to, to, to uh, New Mexico. Man, you, you, you shared stories with us all the way there and all the way back, and you still never show, shared them all with us. You still never ran out, you know. So, anyways, uh, thank you for, for, for telling this story. And if anybody happens to find this stuff with, with this help, that this little information you've given, man, let me know so I can let you know so that you can know it was right there and where it's at and maybe even share a little of of the gold with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd be fine if it happened that way, but uh, I was glad to do it. I have uh, had, did have the uh, choice friends of the Indians. When I was young, I had some very good friends that was old, old Ute Indians, and they told me stories that nobody knows today. They just and they shared those stories freely at that time. But there just got to be so many people looking for those mines. You're talking the, the roads. You're talking the roads mines. R roads mines, yes. Yeah. Several of the mines. There were more than one roads mine. There was a lot of them that he actually got gold from. Uh, one that I remember distinctly that the, the uh, Wapsock family had told me that there was a mine behind a waterfall. He said, you find that waterfall, and he said, behind that waterfall is a good, good mine. But they came from good friends of mine, good Ute Indians. Nowadays, you don't talk to the Ute Indians. You mention gold to them, they'll boot you out of their office. <laughs> funny individuals, but 
Anyway, I was glad to share this with you, and if you find something from my information, more power to you. I, did, uh, I would like to see some people benefit from these mines. They're out there. I've seen the gold. I've seen the gold that came from right near the ridge line on the east slope of the Uinta Mountains that was uh, fabulously rich in gold. And it was a copper formation that it was. I took the piece of that down uh, that was given to me and had that assayed and it was it was just a little under 57,000. Might have been just above, maybe 57,100. So there's rich gold there. And uh, that piece that was given to me, I had assayed, I think, by black and decent at that time. And it was it was very rich. And all of those mines, I think, are rich. Those Spaniards wouldn't have traveled all the way from Spain up through the New Mexico and into these mountains if they didn't find gold that was so valuable that they was willing to make those trips. Uh, they made a few mistakes on their way by doing things to the Indians they shouldn't have done. And of course, then they started warring with the Spaniards and massacres took place. And it was there's quite the stories involved with the Indians and the Spaniards and uh, like I said, I heard another story from, uh, come from the Wapsock Chronicles, is what I'll say. One of the elderly Wapsock people lived over in uh, just, just above, oh, I would say the Utah, uh, so, so U Utah. You palco. That's what I'm trying so, to think. Of. So time out. You gonna tell me another story? No, I'm just gonna tell them that because I if you're gonna tell another story, I'm gonna shut it off and start over again on another story. No, I was not, just gonna okay. tell you that I had some great friends and Well I know you did. I I remember me and you went and visited one one time and, and uh you know we probably better not say this on film so so we won't but but they well, found I, something. I they you. found something that uh, you gave them the information, and they went there and, and found something, and it caused problems between their family to find. I remember that when we went and talked to them. But that's all we're going to say about that. Yeah. Well, we can say it was tiny gold squares. He called them dice. Yeah, and he, he called, called them the, dice. The Indian yeah. called them dice, and that was to they take handfuls of that or whatever, and it was used for trading. It go all down through. From here down in through New Mexico and down into, uh, in some cases, Florida, but more to the Gulf of Mexico area. And they used those little square dice that was buried there for trading and buying food. They knew how much that was worth. The little square probably was an ounce. I don't know. Back then, what was Gold would probably have been five dollars an ounce, but yeah, that was uh, where I took you to visit. I don't give their names out no, because no. people would go and swamp them, and yep, they just get the Indians get mad. Yep, and uh, but they're great friends of mine. It's, uh, it's been great, great sixty years I've had looking in the mountains. Well, like like I said, the, I think the majority of these uh, stories that are out in the treasure books directly came from you, I think, so. Well, I told a lot of them uh, about it, and uh, there's a lot more. Maybe I can give you another story about... Okay, let me shut it off and start over so no, I can I have another one. No, I don't tell it now. Oh, okay. No. <laughs> All right. Maybe we can get together again and I can tell you another story about something that's not new in the mountains. It's maybe quite close to a big city. Okay. Uh, I mentioned the this uh, diary I had. Yeah. That's one that uh, 
I want to take you up and some other people up and if you find something good if you don't maybe you can film it and tell the story and give somebody else a chance to look for it you know Jew man when you tell me stories I don't remember them <laughs> <laughs> that's why I got a video yet <laughs> yeah well <laughs> whoever sees this I can tell you that Terry Carter is one of my best friends well, I thank you. He's I honest. consider you a great friend. <laughs> he's honest as the day is long. If he says he's going to go buy you a Coke, he does it. <laughs> so. Well, good luck to everybody. Hey, thanks, June. That's a wrap.